you're listening to Pod Academy. Can I just tell you a little anecdote? When I was practicing, I was appearing in um, on a motion in the Court of Queen's Bench, interim motion for um, for maintenance, spousal maintenance, and I was acting for the husband. And then he walks in with me, and his wife is there with her lawyer, who's a woman. The court clerk is a woman. The court stenographer is a woman, and the judge was a woman. And he looked at me and he said, "How am I going to get justice?" <laughs> So on the one hand, I wanted to say to him, what makes you think you won't? And on the other hand, I wanted to say to him, now you know what women have been feeling for the last hundred years. I think I just ended up saying something like, don't worry, it'll be okay. (laughs) That was Professor Alison Diddock, Professor of Law at University College London. More and more women are going into the law as solicitors, barristers, legal executives, academics... And in England and Wales, more women than men qualify as barristers, but fewer women than men get promoted to the highest levels. There's only one woman, Brenda Hale, on the UK Supreme Court, for example. Many women lawyers in countries around the world are feminists, and they've been developing an important critique of legal systems and the assumptions underpinning lawmaking. Two feminist barristers, Alison Diddock and Elizabeth Woodcraft, spoke at a meeting of the Haldane Society and Pod Academy was there to record what they said. First off was Professor Diddock. To me, there's no one feminism. It means something different to different people. All I can tell you about is is what it means for me and why it's important for me. And I thought that I'd start with my feminist journey. My feminist journey began in Canada. It began with activism and advocacy. I began working when I was in my 20s at the local rape crisis centre in Canada. I was a counsellor. And together with other women and men in the Women Against Violence Against Women movement, I took to the streets to take back the night. I went to government to agitate for funding when the centre was running out of money. And when that didn't work, we held car washes to raise money for the centre. We went to local libraries, to schools, to courts to advocate for and support our clients. We spoke about violence against women. We went to police stations and hospitals. But most importantly, we worked with rape survivors. We were, this was the the 70s, we were joyously and proudly feminist. We were lesbians, we were straight, we were richer, we were poorer, we were white, we were black, we were First Nations. We were women and men and we were trans women and men. In all of our work, We had to think about relationships to forms of power and institutions of power. And we became acutely aware of the ways that people are differently located and able to exercise their own power with respect to those institutions. I then took these experiences with me to my law degree and after that to my legal practice. Now, you may be aware that in Canada, it's a fused profession. We're both barristers and solicitors. And I practiced for about seven years as a barrister and solicitor. I represented women who suffered domestic violence. I represented First Nations families who found themselves caught up in the child protection system. And if you know anything about the Canadian child protection system, problematic, very similar to what happened in Australia. Represented women seeking equality under the then new Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Now let me tell you, the 80s here were pretty dismal from what I hear, but at least in Canada in the 80s, the federal government gave interest groups money to fund litigation. The National Action Committee on the Status of Women gave this organization I was working with, the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund, a huge pot of money to try and find a meaning for equality in Canada in 1984 when the equality provision of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms first came into effect. Imagine that, the government sponsoring and paying for litigation potentially against itself. These were exciting times back then. We thought and we believed that if only we were clever enough and if only our arguments were well-rounded enough that we could convince, usually the Court of Appeal, this was appellate level litigation, of our arguments. And you know what we did? The judges were very open to it. They were making this up as they went along. They knew they didn't want to go along with the kind of U.S. version of civil rights. They weren't entirely sure what to make of the ECHR at the time. This was a brand new Canadian document. And they did forge very, very interesting ideas of what 
sex equality and all equality meant in Canada at that time, and I'm really pleased to have been a part of it. And this experience taught me that law can sometimes work for the oppressed. The Supreme Court of Canada actually recognized the existence of a phenomenon called the feminization of poverty. Imagine, would any court in England recognize that as a legitimate social phenomenon? Well, the Supreme Court of Canada did. Brenda Hale might. Yes, Brenda might. What I also gained from this experience, I think, and I think that I've brought to my teaching, because after practicing for those number of years, I decided to see if I could hack it in the universities. So what I think I've brought to my teaching and my writing about law is first, a commitment to asking questions that seemed previously to be unaskable. All that seems to be taken for granted as just the way things are is potentially challengeable. We're making this up as we go along, the feminists say. There's no precedent for this. We can ask questions that previously were thought to be unaskable. Second, my experience has confirmed to me that my feminism is rooted in the concrete. Even as a law teacher, I remind myself and my students that feminist theory is different from other political theories. It started on the streets. It started with activism, and then the theorizations came after. It didn't start from the top and work down. Thirdly, my experience of feminism and practicing law taught me that I can't ever disaggregate sex, gender, from class, race, sexuality, just as I can't disaggregate law from culture, economics, or politics. And this last point is illustrated about representing victims of domestic violence. I still can't get out of my head the stream of women with wired jaws and broken arms who sat in my office and told me that they still loved him. And I remain exasperated when people just hear that story and ask, why didn't she just leave? I also get exasperated when I read research that demonstrates that when heterosexual couples have children, women tend to try to fit their job around their child care responsibilities, and men try to fit their child care responsibilities around their job. And people explain these choices and the economic disadvantage that tends to result <coughs> as the consequence of her free choice, for which she alone ought to assume personal responsibility. The object of feminism isn't to give women the choice about whether or not to work or to be primary carers of children. The object of feminism is to give everybody that choice. Being a feminist lawyer for the last 20 years has meant less marching in the streets, less going to court. Rather, it's meant negotiating university colleagues, the university hierarchy, publishers, and my wonderful students, because I teach and I write law from a feminist perspective. And this is true whether I'm teaching feminist jurisprudence, gender law in the state, family law, contract law, or introduction to the English legal system and legal methods. That's fun to teach from a feminist perspective, let me tell you. Try teaching stare decisis and precedent from a feminist perspective. It can be done. You won't be surprised to hear that my feminist perspective also includes a profoundly socio-legal, contextual, and interdisciplinary approach. It says that the study of legal doctrine is only a small part of the study of law. When it's the only part, it is partial and biased. And it masks the role that traditional legal reasoning and legal rules and legal principles and basic legal concepts that we take for granted. It masks the role that these all have in preserving the status quo that continues to favor the already advantaged. Now this is a familiar critical legal studies claim that many of you have heard, I'm sure, but it does describe how I continue to be a feminist lawyer and a feminist law teacher. So it's about asking what are those taken for granted concepts that are supposed to be neutral, what do they really mean? So what does equality really mean? What about the notion of harm? What kind of harm can law actually take cognizance of and provide redress for? What about autonomy? That's a nice liberal notion that we all seem to have some idea. We believe we know what it means. What I want to do in my work is to question these ideas and to see what the possible <laughs> dimensions of them might be that take them out of the realm of the neutral or the objective.
So just think for a moment first about equality. As a lawyer litigating equality cases, and as an academic thinking about what equality might mean, I have to think carefully about different understandings of equality. So first in litigation. To me, litigating equality issues means identifying the problem accurately. Inequality is the problem of disadvantage. It's not the problem of different treatment. Once we identify the problem correctly, then the remedy just seems clear. The remedy isn't treating people the same. The remedy is dealing with the disadvantage. And the disadvantage is more often than not structural. So if we alleviate structural disadvantage, rather than requiring sameness of treatment, we can start thinking about more substantive kinds of equality. But it also means an awareness of how those structural conditions influence one's capacity to exercise agency and influence one's capacity to make choices. And it doesn't assume the way that liberal law does that its subjects are degendered, abstracted claimants and defendants. It situates those people in the structural conditions that they're coming to the court from. So while we have one male solicitor saying in 2010, I don't think there are any barriers to women progressing through the profession other than the barriers they place on themselves, such as having children. They don't have to have children if they don't want to. We had the Supreme Court of Canada saying in 1989 that those who bear children and benefit society as a whole thereby should not be economically or socially disadvantaged seems to bespeak the obvious. Well, you would think. It is only women who bear children. No man can become pregnant. And it's unfair to impose all the costs of pregnancy upon one half of the population. Now, how do we do this? Well, as we argued for LEAF in 1989, laws cannot alter the reproductive capacities of men and women. Those biological givens are biological givens. But laws can and do prescribe the social and legal consequences which attach to those biological givens. Biology may dictate that only women can become pregnant, but it's the legislature and the courts that have the full range of options on what to do about that. One should not attribute to nature or biology the hardships imposed by man-made law. Now, to me, that seems to bespeak the obvious as well. But we still, even today, say there's nothing we can do about this inequality because it's just biology. Ultimately, we had the Supreme Court of Canada striking down as a violation of women's rights any criminal law restriction at all on women's access to abortion services. You know, there's no criminal prohibition on abortion in Canada. It's considered to be a matter between a woman and her medical advisor. And that's on the basis of equality and the Charter of Rights. Okay, now just think for a moment. This is getting a little bit academic. Let me know. In relation to law's understanding of harm, being a feminist academic means to me revealing and challenging law's complacency in identifying the wrongs or the harms that it takes notice of or sees fit to redress. It's not that long ago, for example, when the only way that the law could understand the harm of sexual harassment, once it acknowledged that there was a problem at all and not just office banter, but that the only way it could understand the harm was as a form of discrimination. Well, now we know that it's more than an issue of discrimination. There's an actual harm caused to women. Work now on harm from a feminist perspective includes work in domestic violence. Maybe the harm of domestic violence is not about the physical injury. Maybe the harm of domestic violence is not about physical violence. Maybe the harm of domestic violence is situated more in coercive control, creating for another a state of captivity or the feeling of being in a state of captivity, rather than the individual events of the physical assaults. Yes, those acts of violence may be the means by which the control or the captivity is induced or created, but work done with domestic violence victims themselves suggests that there's also a separate harm in the captivity. How can law address that? It could, if it wanted to. It chooses to recognize the harm of domestic violence as a physical assault. Well, that's the kind of violence that men experience. It's not necessarily the kind of violence that women are experiencing in domestic violence situations. Or another example on harm, what Nancy Fraser calls misrecognition, cultural devaluation of a social group 
Is that a harm that law can take cognizance of? Law can take cognizance of defamation of one's character and in the eyes of right-thinking members of the community, but can it take cognizance of the devaluation of a particular cultural group as a harm? Maybe. Finally, my work is also interested in challenging current legal and political preoccupations with a very particular understanding of autonomy, including how those legal and political preoccupations are connected and how they are in turn related to ideas of free choice and personal responsibility. We see these concepts played out in the Supreme Court decision in Radmacher. That's the decision about prenuptial agreements that some of you might be familiar with. We see its political effects not only on the legal meaning of fairness in the context of financial distribution on divorce generally. There has been a couple of decisions since Radmacher. Courts aim to do fairness in distributing the economic resources of the parties on divorce. Right? And so they're trying to give meaning to fairness. But we had some really good decisions early on that said fairness means non-discrimination, it means some idea of equality, it means the breadwinner's contribution shouldn't be weighted more than the homemaker's contribution, that it's about meeting needs, that it's about um, potentially compensation if somebody was disadvantaged in his or her career, usually her career, by the choices the people made together and how to conduct their family lives, maybe that disadvantage should be part of fairness, or remedying that disadvantage should be fairness. So there were all these ideas. Well, since Radmacher, we've now had a couple of courts saying, no, autonomy is now a part of fairness. Autonomy and personal responsibility for your choices might be a part of fairness. This idea what I would think is an impoverished idea of autonomy, contributes and relates to political enthusiasm as well for the privatization of responsibility for whatever ill befalls us. Whether it's poverty, whether it's homelessness, it's because we made the wrong choices. Now this is evidence in family law reform, it's evidence in the last bow, it's evidence in benefit reform, it's evidence in all of the, the stuff that you guys are probably more aware of than I am. The politics of autonomy are promoted by its new legal meaning and vice versa. Now the weird thing is it's hard to argue against autonomy. It's like, you know, motherhood. How do you argue against autonomy? It's framed in the discourse of freedom, equality, dignity, choice, respect, so how do you argue against it? The problem, as I see it, is that it's counterposed to what I think is its other. Every concept needs an other to give it meaning. And its other now is not the old bugbear of dependency. It's now in a new kind of more touchy-feely language, vulnerability. So we have the autonomous and we have the vulnerable. And the, autonom the role of law for the autonomous is to promote their freedom of choice so that they can then take responsibility for the consequences of those choices. Law is only there to help the vulnerable. And ideally, it's to help them become autonomous. Not only is this dichotomy between the autonomous and the vulnerable problematic in some of the work that I'm doing, because it seems to me people can be both at the same time. Mm. But also, because there's less moral culpability attached to vulnerability than there was to the stigma that was attached to dependency, we see that the way that the law categorizes the vulnerable is really circumscribed. So think, for example, who are the vulnerable in law now? In LASPO, it's victims of domestic violence and children. They're the only people that legal aid will pay for. The vulnerable are defined as victims of domestic violence and children. Mentally incompetent or vulnerable, sometimes the disabled are considered vulnerable. But what the law does is provide them with the resources, ideally the education rather than legal resources, to be able to become autonomous, to cast off that vulnerability and become autonomous. It seems to me that the combined effect of this vulnerability autonomy discourse on the already advantaged and disadvantaged simply permits the state to abdicate any responsibility it has for acknowledging structural contributions to those consequences. Well, this gives you some idea of the kind of work that I do as a feminist legal academic, the kind of work that I did as a feminist lawyer. But I'm also interested in what does being a feminist lawyer mean to you? How do you think you can be feminist lawyers? Now, 
barrister and novelist Elizabeth Woodcraft. When we first talked about this talk, we devised crazy wild title for it how to be a feminist barrister and when i thought about it afterwards i thought perhaps what i should be doing is giving you tips i'll, I'll try and give you some tips and first of all be a feminist and secondly be a barrister the reason i wanted to be a feminist barrister is that i first of all was a feminist i was working for women's aid i was working in 1976 with the national women's aid federation as it then was and we worked with joe richardson who was bringing in the domestic violence act and that act was an extraordinary act i didn't know at the time because i was not a lawyer i didn't do a law degree because what it did was it brought in police powers for injunctions it brought the police into civil actions of course in many ways when we think about human rights and police powers, we're often not very happy about that. And that is one of the difficulties that one often has to juggle when one is a, a feminist barrister to, or as a feminist generally. But this was a wonderful step forward. And I realised that what I wanted to do was, was do a bit more of this because the law seemed very interesting. It seemed that this was a way that one could actually work towards changing women's experiences and changing women's lives. So I decided that I would train as a barrister and what I have wanted to do as a barrister and I think this is what is wonderful about defining yourself as a feminist barrister you have to accept that being a barrister is a pretty good thing to be and people have an extraordinary reaction when you say you're a barrister they think it's great they immediately think you're a QC they ask you if you if you were a solicitor first all of those things but they really think that being a barrister is the top of the tree and you can use that use your position as a barrister to be part of radical organizations feminist organizations like women's aid like rights of women like justice for women those kinds of organizations which are helping women changing the law and just generally being positive for women in our society and of course one of the things is that when we all started I started in 1980 we all thought you know there was a lot to do there was a lot to do Thatcher was in power the irony of it a woman prime minister but we needed to do so much and then then we thought we'd, we'd done quite a lot of it and in fact we thought we'd done most of it but actually I think what we know is that we've got to do it all the time the wheel just keeps turning we have to keep going back we have to keep talking about domestic violence we have to keep talking about women's employment rights we have to talk about women's role in the family so there is always work to be done when i started out i wasn't entirely solely a family practitioner because in 1980 it was quite different you you could do and you did do a bit of everything you did employment you did housing you did family you did crime I was doing all of those sorts of things and then it, it sort of narrowed down and I, I was doing criminal work and family work. But one of the difficulties that I found doing crime was it got to a point in my practice where I was going to start being asked to represent men who were charged with rape and men who had sexually abused children um, or charged with being with having sexually abused children and I simply did not want to do that because my view is that if in that sort of work if you are a woman defending someone charged with that sort of offence you become part of their defence you are seen as a woman who is you know talking to this person smiling joking the jury see you they think well she likes him she she gets on with him he can't be all bad and also the kind of cross-examination that you have to do of rape victims was something which I did not feel I had come to the bar to do. I knew of a case where a friend of mine who was a barrister, a criminal barrister, acted as amicus curiae, representing, in a sense, the victim, the rape victim, which is sort of more along the French line, the inquisitorial system where, where victims are represented. And we all thought that was going to be a great development, but it didn't really ever seem to take off. But once again, if you're thinking of a future at the bar, you're thinking of things you can work on, that may be some, something you could look into and develop that, because I know that women are still given a really hard time. Well, we all know that. Uh, and we know that the conviction rate um, for rape is appallingly low. And so I then decided that I 
I didn't want to do that kind of work, so I would shift my emphasis onto family because the thing about family, of course, is that this is where most women come into conflict with the law. Domestic violence disputes, custody disputes, everything to do with the family, that's where women on the whole are, apart from employment, criminal matters and other things, housing, those sorts of things. But my, my focus, and you have to be a bit focused, was on family and women within that area. Of course, the difficulty was that I came from from a background of domestic violence work with women's aid. And when you start at the bar, it is domestic violence work that you do. And that's wonderful. And you think, this is why I came to the bar. But after you've got about two or three years under your belt, you don't do domestic violence injunctions anymore. Those are baby cases. So you move on to other work, and the politics of your work does become slightly more distant as you move into more rarefied legal cases where sometimes uh, um, uh, you get a chance to really affect the way cases are dealt with and so on. But, but a lot of the time, it's not like that. I mean, one of the, one of the wonderful things when I started at the, at the bar was because it was Thatcher, we had all those public order matters, all those demonstrations where we had the miners, we had anti-apartheid demonstrations, we had animal rights demonstrations... And for me personally, one of the most wonderful parts of my early time at the bar was was representing Greenham Common women, the peace women at um, the Greenham Greenham Common Air Base. And I have to say, as lawyers, we did very little because we just were there. In some ways, we were the the thin blue line between the women and, and the legal system. And sometimes the legal system was very, very scared because they were very powerful, they were quite well organized, and we would troop down to uh, Newbury Magistrates Court, uh, sort of you'd have to get up at five o'clock in the morning and, and go down there and they were lay, it was a lay bench and, and the women who had usually been arrested for breaking into the base, cutting the wire on the fence or mm, some of them had done other things like tried to stop the cruise missiles which would go for late night drives around the countryside and one or two of them put sugar, I think, in the petrol tanks. I don't know. Anyway, oh, how close we were to total destruction. Anyway, um, <laughs> but they were great, and, and that really made you feel you can really use the law imaginatively. You'd be sitting there trying to sort of put a, a point of view across to the, to the magistrates and arguing a point, and then suddenly one of the women would get up and go up to the witness in the witness box, or as he or she was leaving the witness box and say, I'm, I, I'm going to do a citizen's arrest on you for genocide. And, I mean, it was extraordinary. I mean, that doesn't happen in court. But also they would ask us to call various witnesses. So we had, we had a nun from Canada who, who told us all how to make bombs. We had a, a, a woman. In fact, she was a, um, a barrister, a South African barrister who talked about conditions in the mines in South Africa because that's where uranium came from. Bruce Kent and Tony Benn used to come and sit in the back of the court. I mean, it was they were extraordinary times. And because there was a, a political issue, these women n- knew what they wanted to say. They said it in different ways. There were demonstrations, there were petitions, there was arguing. But one of the other ways they, they, they worked was by, by having... Um, by using the courtroom, and they did use us. I mean, they did also, they also changed the law, because I think one of the cases that I did went to the Court of Appeal, and it was for the right of women who lived in benders, and they, I think they were responsible for the the creation of the word bender, which is where you get a a branch of a tree and put plastic over it, and that's your, that's where you live, because they weren't allowed to have tents outside the Green and Common. They argued for the right to vote from a bender, and and they won. So those are the kind of things you can do as a feminist barrister. That and much, much more. I have also just got a few rather depressing statistics, which I'll just very briefly mention to you, just as you are starting out in your careers at the bar. Queen's Council, we've already referred to, which I'm not. So there are 1,160 male Queen's Council in 2006 and 118 women. Uh, In 2010, there were 1,245 and 152 women, so a bit of an increase. What are we complaining about? 
practicing barristers by gender, uh, 2006, 9,900 men, 4,900 women, 2010, 10,000 men, and 5,000 women. Pupil barristers. In 2010 to 11, there were 240 male pupil barristers and 181 female barristers. University attended 2010, 34% from Oxford and Cambridge, 27% from the Russell Group without Oxbridge, and 27.4% from all other universities. When I started at the bar, people would say, oh, we know there aren't enough women judges, but that's because there just aren't enough women at the bar. Well, you know, 30 years on, we're still in the same position. We've still only got one woman in the Supreme Court. We've got about, is it? Four in the Court of Appeal. Four in the Court of Appeal. Yeah, four out of 17. And when the lower down you get, interestingly, the more women you get. I think there's something... 25% district judges are women, something like that. We've still got a long way to go, so there's everything for you to do. So I shall look forward to reading all about you in the years to come. Elizabeth Woodcraft, whose latest collection of short stories, A Sense of Occasion, has just been published, made another podcast for us a year or so ago about feminist legal judgments, featuring Supreme Court Justice Baroness Brenda Hale and Professors Rosemary Hunter and Rosemary Akmuti. Just search Feminism and the Law at podacademy.org.